Good morning. I'm trying uh, what I'm calling sermon number one under quarantine. I don't know if that's optimistic or what, but we'll see. Um, I'm really glad we get to talk this morning, and I am going from Isaiah 55 today. I don't know if I've advertised it already. But this is a cool way to study the Bible. And this is the book of Isaiah. But it's only the book of Isaiah. And the way they do it is you've got the scripture on the one side. And then you have a blank a blank page on the other. Where you can make notes or draw pictures or whatever sort of thing you want to do. And... Um, it's been a neat it's been a neat way to study the Bible because you don't you feel invited to write in it right from the beginning and so that's what you do. But um, so Isaiah 55 just to to dive right in um, Isaiah 55 verse one says, "Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money." And without price. That is uh, just a glimpse, a glimpse into the free grace of God that He's calling them. Come buy the stuff, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And wine and milk were, they're both um, processed foods of the ancient world, right? Because you have to have a cow to have milk. You have to have a lot of abundant grass to feed that cow to have abundant milk. And so milk represents this, this level of uh, prosperity and this level of riches. Because you have land and you have the cow and it gives the milk and you can have it. Same thing with wine. You have to have a vineyard. The vineyard has to grow for years and years and years. And then you have to have this abundant grape harvest. And then the grape harvest you know, has to be turned into wine. And then the wine has to sit and age. And if you're, if you're poor or if you're struggling for your life, you're not going to be able to have wine set back and being kept. And so those would both be... Um, fine things, signs of prosperity, signs of, of goodness and shalom and peace reigning. So come to everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Isaiah is calling out to people, you, if you're thirsty, you can just come to the Lord and have these fine things. And of course, if it sounds familiar, it's because it is. In John 7.37, at the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus gets up, this is John 7.37, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So that feast was the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, and it was where everybody in Israel would go camping for a week and you would go and you would stay in your tent you'd set up a little temporary tent and you would eat under your tent every day and it was like a big camp out and it was in the fall and it was a harvest festival and and we as a family we go camping every fall and um not because of the feast of booths but it is fun when we do go camping in the fall to realize that israel all of israel did this in real life in the fall and uh but i've also been thinking about it this week because we've been on quarantine and we've been shut up in our house and it's kind of like camping and we're kind of structuring out our food and what are we eating when and and um just like we do when we go camping you know you don't want to take too much food out of the cooler because then we won't be able to have sausage for breakfast tomorrow or whatever well in the midst of that festival celebration week of camping jesus stands up and says if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink 
And Isaiah said, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. It's free. You don't, all you have to have is thirst. Just like in Romans, whoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All you have to do is call on his name. All you have to do is be thirsty and you get to drink from his living water. That's the only, the only prerequisite is to be thirsty. Isaiah 55 verse 2. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. It's this whole question of why are you running after stuff that doesn't matter? Why are you running after, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Isaiah is calling out to them, quit wasting your time on these idols. Quit wasting your time. Uh, A little bit later, you'll see how much Israel oppressed the poor to get the stuff they wanted and how awful that was. Quit running after all that. Run after God. Run after the Lord. Incline your ear. Come to me. Hear that your soul may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David, says the end of verse 3. Out of nowhere, David comes into this. Listen diligently to me. Incline your ear. Seek after me. I will make you an everlasting covenant. Boy, I love David. And it sounds like it's out of place. What's great is this is all the stuff that David did. David was seeking after the Lord. David was inclining his ear to the Lord. He was listening diligently. He was eating what was good. In seeking after God. There's at least two times in the scripture, once in 1 Samuel and once in Acts, where it says that David was a man after God's own heart. He wanted what God wanted. He desired what God desired. Like, God, I want what I want to want what you want. Right? That is a great prayer to pray. And that was that was what David wanted. And so All of a sudden, Isaiah brings it in that when you do these things, when this is the way that you act, when this is the way that your life reflects, you are acting like you are part of the line of David. You are acting like his beloved. So, act like David. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come by and eat. When David was on the run, living in caves... Did he have any money? No, but he ran after the Lord. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? He was, uh, David, when he was on the run amongst the Philistines and in the, in the Engedi desert, he was not wasting his time on anything. He was just doing wanting the Lord. Now I know that changed when he became king and yada yada, but when he was really seeking after the Lord, um, he was really doing it. Behold, this is Isaiah 55, 4. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for He has glorified you. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. As we seek after the Lord, people see us seeking after the Lord, and they see the fruit of our lives, and they see um, the outcomes of our activities, and they want it. And it's attractive to them. And they want to live a life like ours. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a parenting expert. I am struggling at it most of the time. Every once in a while, I get something right. And just as an extra bonus encouragement, somebody watches and somebody sees it. 
usually not grandparents, somebody else. And, uh, and they're like, man, that was great how you did that with your kids. Oh man, I want to do that kind of, you know, that kind of thing echoes. There's a, a million more examples of this, but if we seek him while he may be found, we call upon him while he is near. He's near to us all the time. He can always be found by us. We don't always feel like it, right? You don't always feel like you can find the Lord. You don't always feel like he's near. Build up as much as you can while you can. Let the wicked forsake his way, unrighteous man his thoughts. That's either, either about you being, right? I, I am the wicked and I want to forsake my way. I'm the unrighteous and I, I want to throw away my thoughts. Um, you know, Second Corinthians says, take every thought captive and submit it to the obedience of Christ. Every, every thought I think that exalts itself against God, that's fear, anxiety, jealousy, uh, covetousness, lust, any of that, any of those ideas or imaginations or any of those things, grab them as soon as soon as you realize that that idea is exalting itself against God. You grab that idea and throw it out and set your mind on, on good things. Set your mind on the Lord. Rapid, rapid response. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God will always forgive us. He has already forgiven all of our sins on the cross. And so we don't ever have to think, man, that one was really bad. I don't know if he's going to, I need to make things right before I ask for forgiveness. Or I need to, I need to clean myself up before I go to him. You can go straight to him. And to, to convey, I mean, if you sin against me, right, you better make it right if you're going to come ask. I mean, I, I'm not saying that, but that's how I act, right? God's different. Isaiah 55, 8. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. The Lord doesn't have bitterness. The Lord, uh, the Lord is not hurt. He has forgiveness. He has grace. Remember, all you have to do is be thirsty. And you can come to the water. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Praise God. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Like God provides everything we need, right? So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word will always succeed for the things that he has sent it out for. It says in, in one of the Timothys that um, all scripture is God-breathed and good for teaching and rebuking and building up. We can write notes. We can memorize scripture. We can tell our friends. And that scripture will build up and encourage, and rebuke, and it will always accomplish the task for which God has spoken it. And we can have confidence in that. Sometimes it might take 30 years. Sometimes it might take 20. Sometimes it happens right away. But, um, but God's word always, it always accomplishes something for his purpose when we distribute it and give it out. All right, skip ahead to uh, Isaiah 56. It, it has more of that, whoever wants to come, come and the Lord will bless you. You all, all are welcome to call on his name. Um, 57, there's some more rebuke, but then there's, you know, you're rebuked because you're evil and all this stuff, but if you come to him, 
he will he will welcome you and um, he's kind of bringing into focus all the bad stuff they've done in case they forgot or in case they realized we didn't even know that was wrong because they're so lost that they don't even know they don't even know right from wrong to be corrected about what was wrong that's some of 57 and then uh, 57 14 it shall be said build up build up prepare the way remove every obstruction from my people's way for thus says the one who is high and lifted up who inhabits eternity whose name is holy i dwell in a high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite again god will revive us if we are thirsty if we are thirsty for him, if we go to him and we need him, we tell him our need for him, he will answer. He will remove every obstruction. He will take away all sin. If I don't have to waste any time moaning and groaning about how sinful I am, I don't have to waste my time moaning and groaning about how far I am from God because he has brought me near. He has died on the cross for my sins, every single one of them, and he has brought me close to him. And so now I don't have to toil and waste my money on that which does not satisfy. I can just worship him and praise him and live for him and look at him and focus on him. Finally, I want to say a little bit about Isaiah 58, especially because we're in the middle of Lent. And Isaiah 58 is all about fasting. And it's such a good definition of fasting and a good thing to pay attention to when we're fasting. Of course, he yells at him first. Cry aloud, is Isaiah 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up, lift up your voice like a trumpet. He's saying, Isaiah, shout this stuff out, man. Declare to my people their transgression to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways. Okay, so those are both good things. They're seeking God every day. They're delighted to know his ways. As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They look like a righteous country, a righteous nation. They look like they did not forsake God's judgment. They ask me of righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. But then they say, Why have we fasted and you don't see it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? So who's in charge here? If they're doing all kinds of religious things and they are telling God they want to hear from him and then they say, Why are we wasting our time fasting if you're not going to tell us anything, God, they're putting themselves in charge. They're making themselves the boss. They're not fasting to serve God. They're fasting to manipulate an answer out of him. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. You're fasting because you want to get what you want. Um, it's Caleb's birthday is coming up here in about two weeks. And nothing makes a kid go brush his teeth on time or come to dinner on time faster than when he is talking about his birthday presents and what he wants. And we are totally not a, you better be good or you're not going to get it. Um, I don't know where he picked that up because I try to avoid that. But it's true. And it's rough. Sometimes you'll pray to God and you realize, I'm really just trying to manipulate you, Lord. I'm really just trying to get what I want here. Um, God, if, if you do this, then I'll X, Y, Z. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's hard because you think, I'm just manipulating God. I shouldn't even pray for that. No, don't do that. Be honest with God. Say, you know what, God? I am really trying to manipulate you, and I really want this, but I'll do what you want. 
Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and you oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. There he says it. The whole reason they're fasting is to make God hear their voice. And he says, that's not the kind of fasting I listen to, guys. Is this such a fast I choose, a day for a person to humble himself, to bow down like a reed, put on sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? This is the fast God likes. This is Isaiah 58, 6. Loose the bonds of wickedness, undo the straps of the yoke, let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Share your bread with the hungry, bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked, cover him, and do not hide yourself from your own flesh. All of that is really active and really not self-serving. I could easily sit around and not eat any dairy I mean, not easily, because that would include ice cream. But for a day, all right, for a couple hours, I could fast. And I could go without things. But the real service to God is to serve other people and to not oppress them and to care for people that are in need. This totally goes to Matthew 25. When you saw me hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. When I was naked, you clothed me. That is totally going right back to Isaiah 58 right here. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. So righteousness will go ahead of you and the glory of God will be your rear guard, will, will protect things from coming up behind you. Wow. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, speaking of wickedness, it's all the stuff they are doing on their fast. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted. And remember God's criteria for who gets help. Who gets the water? Whoever's thirsty. It's not whoever's thirsty and acts the way I do. It's not whoever's thirsty and is pure. God gives it to whoever is thirsty. Pour yourself out for the hungry. Satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. So we're all cooped up in our house on quarantine. And every once in a while, different people, myself included, have a little fit. We get a little stir crazy. We get a little grumpy. And um, I'll say the number one, the number two cure for that is to go and pray and read your Bible and seek the Lord. But that can be kind of abstract. The number one cure for that is to serve somebody else in the house, is to go wash the dishes or go fold somebody's laundry, um, go play a different special game with somebody or color with somebody. When we serve one another and we really pour ourselves out for the hungry, satisfy the desire of the afflicted our gloom does turn to a noonday it does turn all of that around take our eyes off of ourselves the lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water who waters do not fail and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. Wow. That's the blessing that comes as you pour yourself out. 
Finally, there's this little last bit about the Sabbath, and I thought this would be appropriate to end on because we're trying to keep the Sabbath and we're trying to keep a Sunday with a video church. If you turn your back foot back from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, a holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Well, we're free from the law, of course, and Jesus, um, he said all kinds of stuff about the Sabbath, that it's it's made for us, we're not made for it. We, um, we don't have to submit to it, the Sabbath has to submit to us. And so there's no law, there's no judgment, none of that. But in the Old Testament, the way these people expressed their faith was by one day a week, completely surrendering all their own self-striving and leaving it all to God. And that's why Jesus is our Sabbath, because we have stopped striving for God to like us, striving for righteousness, and we're le- leaving it all on Jesus. We're leaving it all on Him. And so the same way of, if we turn our back from Jesus, if we if we turn our back from doing our own pleasure for ourselves and we call Jesus a delight and holy Jesus honorable, if we honor him not going our own way or seeking our own pleasure or talking idly, wasting our words with anything but him, then you'll take delight in the Lord. God will make you ride on the heights of the earth He will feed us with the heritage of Jacob, our father, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. As we rest on Jesus, as we rely on him, God becomes our delight. And then we just rest on him even more, right? All right, thanks. God bless you guys.